Well, that video from last uh, Sunday, and actually the event itself, was a, a great reminder for me and hopefully for all of us that we are not only a church of multiple services and multiple worship styles and multiple campuses, we're a church of multiple generations. And I've said for many years, one of the great blessings of being part of this church is a blessing many churches don't have. That is, we're growing older and younger at the same time. And that video with its pictures, and if you were there last Sunday, you could, you could see that in a way we can't see it when we're just at one campus or one service. So that's a great blessing. What a great day it was. And uh, we celebrate uh, what God is doing in and through uh, this, His church. Well, I've shared many times over the years that my very first role in ministry was as a part-time youth pastor at a church in Glen Ellen. I was a 26-year-old single seminary student, and my only experience in ministry had been growing up in the church and at one time actually being a middle school or high school student. There was no internet in those days and no way to uh, get ideas other than to read books or to look at magazines or ask my youth ministry friends. And one of the ideas uh, that was sweeping the youth ministry world uh, in the early 80s was uh, something called a planned famine. Now, Planned Famine was a 24-hour retreat for young people where students would learn about the realities of life in the developing world, where millions of people struggle with hunger and poverty. And the, the plan was you would um, do this event, an overnight retreat, and you would feed the students, high school students, only rice and water for most of the 24 hours, and you would uh, expose them to what was happening in the rest of the world, teach about what Jesus, how Jesus wants us to respond with great compassion and generosity, and then at the end you'd wrap up with a decent meal, uh, pizza or something. Well, I like the idea, uh, but I thought I could make it even a better idea, uh, make it have, it have greater impact on these students' lives if I made the famine part a surprise. Does that sound like a good idea to you? Doesn't to me now either. But I sent out the flyers, going to have this overnight retreat, and I knew they would be coming with all kinds of excitement, expecting to have fun and eat large quantities of, of pizza and what else, you know. And they arrived at church, and once they got all there, I announced, surprise, this is a planned famine event. You're not going to get pizza. In fact, I decided to go uh, cold turkey, actually no turkey at all, no rice at all, just water. And then I went around and I confiscated all the Twinkies, chips, Skittles they'd brought along with their sleeping bags. And I started teaching them about the realities of world hunger. And as you might guess, it was about two hours in and I had a full-scale mutiny on my hands. <laughs> I'm talking violent revolution. Uh, kids were sneaking around trying to find where I'd stashed the food. Some were breaking out of the church and crossing the street to a convenience store to buy candy bars. One kid even broke a window in the bottom of the church to escape the church building. True. What I learned through that planned famine event is that not even a seminary education can keep you from being a complete knucklehead. It's a great learning. <laughs> now, the event failed uh, because I had failed to prepare the students for what was going to be asked of them. Our theme this fall is with Jesus. And one of the great themes of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where we see the story of Jesus, is what happens when people are actually with him. What life looks like when Jesus is with them. Now, we're going to start in Luke chapter 14. And at this point in the Gospel narrative, uh, Jesus has already been teaching about the Gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God, for nearly three years, he's toward the tail end of his ministry, and he's now headed toward the cross. But neither his disciples nor the crowds that are following him uh, are aware of that yet. They don't really know yet that the cross is looming just ahead. Some think he's just a new prophet. Some think he's going to re uh, become a king like David and restore Israel to its former glory and kick out the Romans. And Jesus chooses this moment to teach about what it means to be with him. Luke chapter 14, I'm going to read 25 through 33. You can look in your Bibles or watch on the screens, screen as I write, as I read. Now, great crowds accompanied him. We'll talk about the crowds in just a moment. 
And he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Now, this is arguably among Jesus' most difficult teachings. Um, and I have to admit, it's a very difficult passage to, to preach adequately on. Uh, it sounds very harsh to our modern ears. What could he possibly mean by hate your father and mother, your sister and brother, and your own children? Well, let's dig in and see if we can understand. First thing Jesus is saying here in this passage is that being with him, being with Jesus means leaving the crowd. Being with him means leaving the crowd. Many of you know a little bit about the story of a historical figure named Charles Blondin. Actually, he was born Jean-Francois Gravelet, a French acrobat who achieved enormous fame and wealth in the mid-1800s by crossing Niagara Falls on a tightrope. Uh, Blondin actually became so famous that Abraham Lincoln actually compared himself to Blondin in the presidential election of 1864. But in the summer of 1859, the great Blondin, as he liked to call himself, stretched a tightrope over Niagara Falls, 160 feet above the water, and some over 1,000 feet long, with no safety net, and proceeded to walk across. Uh, and the crowds who gathered to watch this held their collective breath. Nobody had ever seen anything like this before. And over the coming weeks and months, that year and the couple of years that followed, he continued to draw bigger and bigger crowds by repeating the crossing, only he would do it in different variations each time. For example, he would walk while juggling. He would walk across blindfolded. He would walk backwards blindfolded across the, the, the tightrope. He would walk while carrying a chair, at one time bouncing the chair on one leg and climbing up on it and standing on it. He was an amazing acrobat. He well, walked across that tightrope on stilts one time. Sometimes he would push a wheelbarrow across loaded with a sack of potatoes. And so he drew crowds and crowds and crowds. He was making enormous fame and even money for himself. The story is told that after pushing a wheelbarrow across one time, that Blondin then challenged the crowd. Whipping him up into a frenzy. Do you believe the great Blondin can cross the tightrope? Yes, yes, we believe. Do you believe I can push a wheelbarrow across? Yes, we believe. We've seen you. Do you believe I can push a man in the wheelbarrow across? We believe. And he said, now I need a volunteer. <laughs> there is a story that's, I don't believe, apocryphal, that he eventually carried a man on his back across who happened to be his manager. But no one volunteered that day to get into the wheelbarrow. See, there's a big difference between being in the crowd and being with Blondin. So Luke writes, Now the great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now Jesus here is distinguishing being in the crowd from being a disciple. Being in the crowd is to be curious about Jesus. Being in the crowd is to be intellectually interested in what he's talking about. Maybe even to be mildly inspired by him. But not necessarily a disciple. Being in the crowd is to be a spectator. Hoping to see Jesus do something amazing. Maybe he'll do a miracle. Maybe he'll heal someone. Maybe he'll give me food when all I have is stones. See, many in the crowd those days were watching and following him because he would become kind of a celebrity. There's a difference between being in the crowd and being a disciple. To be a disciple is different. The word translated disciple in Greek is mathetes, and it means one who learns, one who follows. It means both following the teachings of and living the lifestyle of the one 
who is the master. And if we apply this to Jesus, it means one who anchors his or her faith, one who anchors his or her identity, one who finds his or her purpose, hope, and life itself in Jesus. So what does Jesus mean when he says, in verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now obviously here, he's not using the word hate in the way we sometimes use the word today. We know this because in other places, Jesus actually teaches us to love one another. Jesus affirmed God's commandment to honor your father and mother. Jesus taught us to love our neighbor as ourselves. So here he must be using the words hate and love in a different way, and he is. In Jesus' day, a rabbi would use words like love and hate, not in an emotional sense, the way we usually think of them, but in a kind of practical sense. Uh, to refer to a person's priorities, their preference, their allegiance. Think about it like this. If I say, if I say I love the Cubs, I'm saying that I'm a loyal fan, that they're my favorite team. But if I said that in the way an ancient rabbi would say it, uh, I would be meaning by definition that I hate all other teams. If I say I love chocolate ice cream, I would be saying that by comparison, I hate all other foods. Meaning that my interest in and my fondness for any other team or any other food pales in comparison to my allegiance to the Cubs or my preference for chocolate ice cream. You get it? That's what he's saying. So when Jesus says, unless you hate your father and mother and your wife and children, you cannot be my disciple, he's saying that our love for him, our devotion to him, must cause all other loves to pale in comparison. He's saying that being his disciple, being with him, demands and produces a radical change of allegiance and identity. If we look at John chapter 1, there's a beautiful story of the calling of the very first disciples. I'm going to read it for you because I think it illustrates what we need to see here. John 1, 35, we read, The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist, who was seen as a prophet and had his own followers, his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Now, that's a big deal, giving Jesus that title. I'll talk about that in just a moment. Verse 37, when the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. The seemingly simple little interaction but something very profound happens here. We need to see it. First, notice that Jesus is identified here as the Lamb of God and the Christ. Now, as the Lamb of God, he would be the one that the Old Testament prophet said was coming to, to rid the world of his sin, who could take away the sins of the world, the final sacrifice of the Lamb of God, whose blood sacrifices for all the sins of the world. And that's what Andrew and the other disciple saw in Jesus, the Lamb of God. Christ means Messiah, the one who comes to deliver his people. So Simon Peter's brother Andrew and another young man follow him. Then Jesus asks a simple question, what do you want? But he's not just asking, you know, hey, what, what do you guys, what do you want? It's a, it's a deeper question than that. It's a profound question. He's asking, do you want to be in the crowd or do you want to become my disciples? Are you just curious? Do you want to see a miracle or two? Or do you want to follow me with your whole life? And then the two would-be disciples ask their own question. They say, where are you staying? This is their way of saying, no, no, we want to be your disciples. We want to follow you. But what will it be like? What's it going to take? And then Jesus gives an invitation. Come and see. Come and see. And it says they spent that day 
with him. They became his disciples, changed their entire allegiance, changed their entire lives. So Jesus' invitation to follow to discipleship demands a decision. To follow Jesus, you have to leave the crowd behind. To follow Jesus, you have to reorder your heart, reorder your allegiances. To follow Jesus means that your identity and purpose no longer comes from your family. Your identity and purpose no longer comes from your culture, even from yourself or your job or your education. It comes now from Jesus, who is the Lamb of God, the Christ, the only one who can promise forgiveness of sin, new birth, and eternal life. To be with Jesus means leaving the crowd. Secondly, in this passage, we see that being with Jesus is costly. Being with him is costly. Years ago, I was a volunteer basketball coach for a short time at Taylor University while I was working my way through graduate school. And one of my roles there was to help supervise uh, what we called the fall conditioning program. As guys would get on campus, everybody coming out for the team had to go through this four-week uh, conditioning, grueling conditioning um, period of time, mostly about, about running, sprints and distance and so forth, to prepare for the coming season. And the final conditioning test of that whole month was something that we called the 12-minute run. 12-minute run sounds pretty simple, doesn't sound too intimidating, but it was a brutal test of conditioning. Uh, we, did, we, we had this, uh, you, you lined them up on a, on a track, and you just told them to run as far and as fast as they could for 12 minutes. Doesn't sound that hard until you tried to do it, do it. Well, we had this one year, we had this one kid come out for the team who had already been at school for a couple of years playing intramural basketball. Big guy, 6'4", well-built, shocker red hair, so we called him Big Red. But he was uh, kind of famous in intramural circles for being a good player. And he also was known for, uh, for bragging about himself, saying to people, yeah, I could be on the varsity team, I just don't want to. In fact, I'd probably be one of the best players, but, you know. So finally this year, he came out for the team. We're all curious. He came out for the conditioning program. But we learned fairly quickly that he wasn't really in that good a shape. He wasn't really prepared for what we were going to ask him to do. We would noticed when we did sprints, if he was running right in front of where the coaches were, he would run fast and finish in front. But if he was on the other side of the track where he didn't think we could see, he would loaf and slow down and try to catch his breath. So we kind of figured him out. But when the day of the 12-minute run came, uh, there was no place to hide because you just start running on the track. So we started the boys off running, and after the first lap, he was right in the front, just going like crazy. Oh, we'll see how long this lasts. By the second lap, four, three or four minutes into the run, he was starting to drag a bit. By the third lap, he was dead last and looked like he was really in trouble. At about the eight-minute mark in the 12-minute run, he was all the way on the other side of the track, and he stopped running completely. He turned around and started walking back across the field to where we were. And the standing rule in this program was if you stop running, you just cut yourself. Don't care how slow you go, but you have to keep running. That was the coach's rule. So we knew he had decided he didn't want to play ball anymore. So he walked all the way across the track, and we waited. You know, he came to his moment of decision, and he walked across. We were waiting to see what he was going to say. He got to us all the way across, took several minutes, and he was still breathing hard, and he had glasses on. <laughs> he walked up to us, and he said to the head coach who was right next to me, he said, Coach, I've been praying about this a lot lately, and I just don't have any peace about playing ball this year. And I'll never forget it. Without skipping a beat, the coach looked right back at him and said, Son, middle of a 12-minute run is no place to be looking for peace, he said. In other words, becoming a member of the team is going to demand a cost, a sacrifice. And Big Red was not quite prepared for the cost of a 12-minute run. Jesus continues his teaching here in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build but was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in the war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, if any one of you does not renounce all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Again, this sounds very, very harsh to our ears. Doesn't sound like a very good way to recruit followers, does it? Seems like it would be better to say, hey, if you follow me, 
I promise to make you healthy and wealthy. I'm going to make your life great. I'm going to make your life easy. That's not what Jesus says. He says, if you follow me, there's going to be a cost. It's not going to be easy. So what is the cost he's talking about? Now let's look at this a little bit different way. What if I ask, what's the cost of getting married? Now we all know that there's a cost to every wedding, uh, but I'm not talking about the financial cost. Uh, I'm talking about uh, the personal cost. I've done four or five weddings this summer. I'm going to do my own son's wedding at the end of this month. Uh, I'm talking about the personal cost. Now, we usually don't think of it like that. We usually think of marriage in terms of what we gain. We gain a life partner. We gain intimacy, security, and joy. But there is a cost. Right in the middle of a wedding ceremony, when I'm leading a couple through the vows, there is a line that they both say, forsaking all others, I cleave only unto you. Forsaking all others. That means they sacrifice every other possible marriage partner on the whole face of the earth to choose this one as a cost. What if I ask, what's the cost of becoming a parent? Now we could add up all the the dollars it takes to raise a child, but that's not not what I'm talking about. Just as with marriage, parenting comes with a cost, an emotional cost. When you get married or when you become a parent, you willingly... And knowingly, sacrifice your life. You give it away. Your life is no longer your own. You live not only for yourself, you live to and for another or others. That's what Jesus is saying. There is a cost to leaving the crowd behind and becoming a disciple. There is a cost to being with them. Now, yes, we gain. When we make that decision, we gain. Through faith, we gain a new heart through the forgiveness of sins. New identity by being called his children. New purpose, living for his kingdom. And new destiny to be with him forever. But there is also a surrender that takes place. Jesus says in verse 27, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Now what does he mean here? Think about this. The cross hasn't happened yet. They didn't know he was going to go to his own cross. Nobody knew that at the time except Jesus. The cross was not yet a symbol of forgiveness and redemption. The cross was a Roman instrument of torture and death. So he doesn't mean physical death here. He means dying to that which we once depended on for purpose, meaning, and identity. He means dying to all that cannot provide salvation and life. And it's a call to absolute surrender. It's what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote in Philippians chapter 3, What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. When you decide to leave the crowd and follow Jesus, you forsake all others. It means you love him more than the cultural idols of entertainment or achievement or success or money. When you decide to follow him, it means you will learn to love your neighbor as yourself, even when that neighbor doesn't look like you or believe like you. It means you will learn to pray even for your enemies as he teaches us to pray. It means you will learn how to touch the leper, the one no one else touches. You'll move toward those who others avoid and shun. You'll risk the consequences. It means you might be considered strange. It means you might be seen as being completely out of step with culture. You might be rejected or seen as weird by your family and friends. Jesus wants you to know there is a cost to leaving the crowd. That's why he gives these two interesting illustrations. No one builds a tower or builds a building without first figuring out what it will cost so he can finish. No one fights a battle without carefully considering what that battle is going to require. Jesus wants us to know up front there will be a cost to being with him. But he also wants us to know that being with him promises reward. That's the third thing today. Being with Jesus promises reward. So, 
Jesus says, Therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all he has cannot be my disciple. And yet, this same Jesus said in John chapter 15, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This same Jesus said in John 10, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So which is it? Renounce everything or gain a life that is full of abundant joy. Which is it? It's both. It's both. This is the gospel. That which demands everything, but gives even more. Being with Jesus demands, begins with a decision. To leave the crowd and become a disciple, a follower. That means to decide... That he is who he says he is. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's the only one who can forgive sin and promise eternal life. Being with Jesus grows then through surrender. It means to die to counterfeit gods, to imposters, to counterfeit lords, to die to all that cannot bring life. Being with Jesus leads then to reward. The Apostle Paul himself wrote in 2 Timothy, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. It's what the Apostle Peter wrote about in 1 Peter chapter 5. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. It's what James, who we just studied this past summer, says in James 1, Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who receive him. The Bible clearly talks about rewards, crown of righteousness, crown of glory, crown of life. They clearly point to a glorious reward that is promised to those who are with him. This past week, uh, we all watched many hours of coverage as our nation responded to the death of John McCain. Senator, soldier, naval aviator. We heard all the stories again, uh, spoken and written of defining times in his life. He served as a Navy pilot during the Vietnam War, shot down over Hanoi in 1967. Uh, He rejected from his plane, broke both arms and a leg in the process, captured by the North Vietnamese, held as a POW for five and a half years. We heard all those stories, awful stories. Um, of, of, of time in POW prison. McCain was tortured and beaten. Uh, the injuries he suffered while there left him unable to lift his arms over his head for the rest of his life. At one point, um, after refusing to be released early because his father was an admiral, he, he wanted to wait his turn. Uh, they, they beat him every two hours for four days in a row, eventually coaxing confessions out of him. He signed documents and participated in propaganda that he eventually later regretted for the rest of his life. So you would think that after that experience, McCain would have been only bitter about so much time and health taken from him. But in reflecting on those years in, as a POW, McCain often made reference, and I saw this in many, many of his speeches and written many times, He made reference to a surprising truth he discovered in the midst of brutal captivity. This is how he said it. He said, nothing in life is more liberating than to fight for a cause larger than your own self-interest. Nothing in life is more liberating than to fight for a cause larger than your own self-interest. Now, his cause, of course, at that time, was to fight for his fellow POW soldiers and for his country. And his cause made all else Even physical deprivation and suffering pale in comparison. Here in this passage, in this teaching, Jesus is telling us that the greatest cause, purpose of our lives is to follow him, to be with him. And he wants us to know that that following, that with, will come with a cost. Because we must leave the crowd. 
We must forsake all other gods with a small g. But he wants us also to know that that cost pales in comparison to the promised reward. In John 14, Jesus talks about heaven, new heaven and new earth. He says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me. And take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Here's the promise of discipleship. This is where we begin our whole fall emphasis. You will be with me. That's the promise. Will you bow your heads as I close? Lord Jesus, we thank you today for your word. Even those words that we find difficult to understand, even those words that cut to the heart and challenge us to the core, we thank you for your word. Help us today to understand that your call to leave the crowd, to forsake other loves, other things, to be with you, is not harsh, but rather is grace itself. That it's an invitation that comes from your great love for us. So help us to hear, respond, and long for your great and eternal reward. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.